Welcome everyone to the last session of our workshop. The first talk will be by Rong Ge from Duke University. Oh, thanks. Uh, thanks for uh, inviting me. Uh, and, and thanks for sticking to the last session. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, recent work about explaining landscape connectivity of uh, low-cost solutions for multi-layer nets. So this is joint work with uh, Rohis uh, and Xiang. Rohis is an undergrad at Duke. Uh, Xiang is a grad student with me. Uh, and um, many people from Princeton, Holden, Yi, uh, Zhiyuan, Wei, and Sanjeev. Uh, Zhiyuan is probably somewhere in the audience. Uh, yeah. Right, so uh, so to start with, let, let me just say what is this uh, landscape connectivity that I was talking about. So this is a uh, word also known as uh, mode connectivity. So this is a phenomena that has been recently discovered. Uh, so the so phenomenon says for neural networks, local minima found by gradient descent or any other popular optimization algorithm that you use in practice. So local optima are connected by simple paths in the parameter space. Uh, so if you took, uh, take a look at this picture, so A is one of the local minima for a neural network. B is another local minimum. Think of B as found by uh, running gradient descent on a different random initialization. Sorry, what are these coordinates? And what's the uh, right, so, so this is just the projection of the parameter space into a two-dimensional space. But which one? Uh, well, I, I will be more precise later. Uh, but for now, A and B are just two random local minima that you were able to find. Uh, and the colors are the loss, uh, the value of the loss function. So the warmer colors means the loss is low, and the uh, colder colors means the loss is uh, high. So as you can see, if I go directly between these two solutions, if, if I do a linear interpolation between the two, uh, there is actually a barrier between the two. The loss in the middle is actually much higher than the loss at the two endpoints. Uh, but uh, the su surprising phenomena that was found in, in these papers was that you can actually connect these two uh, by just finding a third point, uh, uh, by finding an intermediate point C, such that if I go from A to C and then from C to B, then throughout this entire pass, the loss is low. So now I can say, what is this projection? This projection is just because we have three points, I project to the span a fine span of these three points. That, that's, uh, that's where this picture came from. Um, right, so every point on this path is another solution uh, of the neural network of almost the same cost. Uh, so uh, I guess if you were here for Leon's talk on Monday, this might not be super surprising to you because uh, he was essentially talking about a very similar phenomena. Uh, but let me still explain why it was very surprising to me when I first saw uh, this property. Um, so the reason this is very um, uh, strange to me when I first saw the phenomena is because I've been thinking about these uh, local minima and symmetry in uh, non-convex optimization. Roughly speaking, uh, for the problems that we understand, uh, there are two types of problems for which we have some understanding on their optimization landscape on where the local minima are. Uh, so the first type of problems are what I'm going to call the matrix problems. So in these problems, your goal is to find a low rank matrix. Um, and, so, uh, and the way you do that is you are going to parameterize this low rank matrix as the product of two smaller matrices. So you no longer need to worry about the rank constraint. Uh, so this, uh, if M can be written as XX transpose, is automatically low rank. Um, but uh, in this formalization, if you find an optimal solution X star, it's not going to be the unique optimal solution because you can uh, apply an arbitrary uh, rotation matrix uh, on top of that solution. Uh, and there are many equivalent solutions, right? Uh, so another type of problem is what I'm going to call tensor problems. Uh, I mean, these are not necessarily all about tensors, but, but they have the same symmetry. So the goal of these type of problems is to find k things. They can be, say, k components of a tensor or k centers for a clustering or, and, and so on. Uh, 
so in this case, uh, what I care about is I want to find these k things, but I don't care about the ordering of these k things. It's a, uh, it's a set of uh, vectors, you can think about it. So in this case, uh, I can no longer apply an arbitrary rotation matrix to the solution, but I can still uh, apply an arbitrary permutation matrix to the solution, and, and the solution would be the same. Uh, so for these two type of problems, I always think that for matrix problems, um, I mean, because the set of rotation matrices is, uh, is kind of connected, it's not exactly because, I mean, it has two connected components corresponding to determinant one and minus one, uh, but it's still mostly connected. It only has two connected components. Uh, so I would expect the picture to look kind of like this, like what we saw in, in the previous slide. Uh, but for the tensor problems, because the equivalent solutions are discrete, um, uh, I've always been thinking that uh, they should have these kind of isolated local minima. And in fact, it's indeed true that for the actual tensor problems, they have these isolated local minima. Uh, and then the question is, uh, what problem is a neural network? Well, for neural networks, because there are nonlinearities, uh, if you just apply a rotation to your weight matrices, that's not going to give you the same neural network. So I, I guess before, I was always thinking that neural networks look more like the tensor kind of problems, uh, where you are trying to look for components. In this case, will be uh, the weights of the neurons, right? Uh, so. So then uh, they might have isolated local minimum, but that was not true, right? As we saw in the previous slide, for neural networks that people use in practice, they have a connected local minimum. Uh, so why is this? Well, uh, there has been, um, so there has been some explanation of this uh, mode connectivity property. Uh, and there's uh, the short answer is uh, or prime transition, like, like the answer to many other questions uh, that we heard uh, in this uh, workshop. Uh, so ex existing works can explain mode connectivity to some extent. So these works basically show that if the network has special structure, uh, it's either two layer or a multi-layer neural network, but with some special connections. Um, and if the network is what I will call highly over parameterized, then the local min minima are connected. So by highly over parameterized, I mean the number of neurons should be larger than the number of training samples. And in fact, there's a, there needs to be a constant factor gap, uh, but that's not super important. Um, well, these are nice, but um, the problem with these explanations is that neural networks in practice, uh, that in the experiments that I uh, just showed you, uh, they are not as overparameterized as this, right? Uh, I mean, we, we know that neural networks are almost always overparameterized, uh, but it's not clear whether the number of neurons needs to be a lot larger than the number of training samples. Usually it's enough if the number of parameters is larger than the number of training samples, and number of neurons is obviously much smaller than the number of parameters, even for a two-layer neural network. Uh, so our goal here is to try to prove a similar result, so try to understand why uh, the local minima can be connected in a mildly overparameterized regime. And by that, I mean the number of neurons, uh, at especially the number of neurons per layer, is smaller than the number of training samples, but maybe the number of parameters is still larger than the number of training samples. Okay. Uh, and in general, I, I feel like we, we should uh, start working on this uh, regime for, for many other problems as well. Uh, um, okay, so, so roughly speaking, our result shows for neural networks, uh, what we observe is actually not always true. Uh, so there are cases where not all local minima or global minima are connected, even in the over parameterized setting. Uh, so of course, uh, uh, we already know in the highly overparameterized setting, everything is connected. So here by overparameterized setting, I, I mean something uh, that's only mildly overparameterized. Uh, on the other hand, even though not all local minima are connected, what we show is that solutions that satisfy some reasonable property 
uh, that we will call dropout stability. So these solutions are actually connected by a pass. Um, and uh, in the paper, we also show it's possible to uh, switch this dropout stability notion with some other notion of stability, like noise stability, that are, that were used for proving generalization bounds for neural networks. Question. So how, like, uh, if, you, if you just train some particular neural network, is it easy to test if like uh, local minima are connected or it's like intractable? Or... Oh, okay. Yeah, good question. Right. So. So basically, you are asking how easy it is to produce the first figure that I showed you, right? How, how easy is it is to find this path? Yeah, not for like special network. Uh, right. It actually, in practice, is actually surprisingly easy. Okay. As, as I said, uh, the path is just uh, a two line segments. So you can just parameterize the path using the middle point, and you do gradient descent on that. And that actually works very well in practice. Uh, we, uh, I mean, we pr we will prove existence of paths in cer certain cases, but we are, of course, very far from proving like this approach is going to find you a path. Okay. Uh, dropout stability. Can you define? Uh, Sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm going to define okay. that. Uh, okay. So uh, before going to that definition, let me first just uh, try to uh, talk about the. Uh, notation or settings that we are going to talk about. So for simplicity, we are go only going to focus on fully connected networks, but uh, the same thing actually can be extended to convolutions and other things. Uh, so we'll have weight matrices uh, W1 to WP. So these are just matrices for different layers. Non-linearity sigma, which uh, we will assume is just ReLU. Uh, we get many samples, so we hope to learn a network. Uh, and the function computed by the network, I'm going to call that f of theta. And theta is the set of parameters in all of these weight matrices. Uh, what's important is here, like in the top layer, uh, in the output layer, you don't have a nonlinearity, which is also fairly standard. Um, and in the objective, the objective is uh, the training loss. Uh, so. You just take the average over the loss on each of your training samples. And here, L is just uh, any loss function that, as long as it is convex in terms of the second parameter here, uh, it, it is OK. So either it's a square loss or a cross entropy, both of them are OK. Um, so our first result shows that um, in the mildly over parameterized regime, not all local minima are connected. Uh, <laughs> We actually give a very concrete counterexample in a very simple setting. So it's just a two-layer neural network. And the data xi and yi is actually generated by a ground truth neural network with just two hidden neurons. So that means there is a neural network with two hidden neurons that can compute yi given xi. So uh, the function is actually very simple. Um, we consider our prime transition in the sense that we are going to try to uh, consider uh, fitting this function uh, with a two-layer neural network with h hidden neurons. And h is much bigger than 2. Uh, h can be any uh, constant that's bigger than 2. So what we show is for any h, there exists a data set with just h plus 2 samples, uh, such that the set of global minimizers are not connected. So there are, exist two, local, uh, two global minimizers. And if you want to go from one to the other, you have to pass something that has a non-zero loss. And uh, co connected components in this case would be just like isolated points, so it's still some small neighborhood. Uh, no, they are not I isolated points. Uh, in general, uh, <coughs> for example, in this case, we still have the number of parameters to be larger than the number of uh, uh, training samples. Right. In that case, usually you expect uh, that the set of uh, minimizers to form some uh, low-dimensional manifold. Uh, but the question here is whether these manifolds are globally connected or they have different connected so components. Tight bounds on the number of connected components. Uh, we, we don't have that tight bond. But uh, in some sense, this bond is uh, fairly tight because we, we are just, uh, my, uh, our number of uh, samples is just slightly larger than the number of neurons. So we are just slightly in the mildly over parameterized regime. But even uh, in this case, not all the minimizers are connected. So now since not all the minimizers are connected, we can ask what kind of local minimum should be connected. Well, 
first we notice that the empirical results only show that uh, local minima found by standard optimization algorithms are connected. It doesn't necessarily, op like, like ob obviously we cannot enumerate all the local minima or all the global minima of neural networks, so we don't know whether they are all connected or not. And the local minima found by these standard optimization algorithms uh, have some special properties. Uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this workshop previously, uh, uh, many people also talked about um, what can we say about uh, solutions that are found by standard optimization algorithms is closely connected to the question of generalization and implicit regularization. Uh, there are many conjectures, uh, but um, uh, the one we are going to use in this talk is going to be uh, what we call dropout stability. So what is dropout stability? Um, so we say a network is epsilon dropout stable if we can zero out 50% uh, of the nodes at every layer, and we, we are allowed to rescale the other uh, weights of other neurons appropriately. Uh, if doing this only increases its loss by at most epsilon. So what's your quantifier? Is it like for every zeroing out or for random zeroing out? Or uh, there exists a zeroing out. Uh, so if you do dropout training, uh, kind of you, the uh, guarantee you are expecting is for a random zeroing out of 50% of the nodes, your performance is still good. Uh, what we require is actually weaker than that. We only require there exist a dropout of 50% of nodes. It's, it's like saying you can prune your neural network to remove half of the neurons at every layer. Yeah, so here's just a picture uh, representation. Uh, this is the original network, but after removing half of the neurons at every layer, it will look like this. Uh, for technical reasons, we don't just require dropping out just for both layers. Uh, you can also drop out a subset of layers from the top to bottom. So in this example, you can also just drop out the top layer without touching the bottom layer. Um, okay, so what we can show is if we have two parameters for this neural network, theta A and theta B, if they are both dropout stable, then we can construct a pass between them, and the maximum loss on this pass uh, is going to be less or equal to the maximum loss at the endpoints plus epsilon, where epsilon is the parameter in this dropout stable definition. That, that holds for just two layers or for any depth? Uh, yeah, so this is actually for any number of layers. Okay, so, uh, I, uh, so in the remainder of the talk, I'm going to show you roughly how we can prove uh, such a thing. So at a high level, because we are assuming dropout st uh, st stability to go from this solution number one, to solution number two, uh, there are just three high-level steps. So first, we will go from this network to its dropout version. And then uh, the last step is going to be we go from a dropout version of the second network to, to the uh, network itself. Uh, now the middle step is actually fairly simple because now both of these networks have only half of their capacity, right? Only half of the neurons are active. The other half of the neurons are, are all set to zero. So I can actually linearly interpolate between these two neural networks. And uh, these two sides of the neural network will behave independently of each other. So the output I'm going to have is going to be a linear combination of the outputs. And we know if since the uh, uh, since the objective is uh, convex in the final output, uh, this intermediate step, I can just do a linear interpolation and things are going to be good. So the thing that we really need to worry about is how to connect a network uh, with its dropout version. Uh, and uh, I'm not going to show it, but um, in general, doing a direct linear interpolation, in this case, it's not going to work because uh, the loss function is not convex in, in, the, in terms of the weights. Uh, so how can we connect a network with its dropout version? Uh, our main observation is there are two ways you can connect things. You, you can use two type of, types of line segments. So we say a type A uh, line segment is if there are two networks that both have low loss and they only differ in the top layer weight. So all the previous layers, they have the same weight, but the top layer weights are different. 
then we can linearly interpolate between them. Why? Because the loss function is actually convex in terms of the layer weight of the top layer. Uh, so, uh, but of course, if I only use type A line segments, I can never change any of the layers at the bottom, so I need another uh, tool. So this type B uh, line segment says if a group of neurons do not have any outgoing edges, so if they don't uh, output anything, then obviously these neurons are not useful, so I can change their incoming edges to anything that's arbitrary, right? It will not change the output of the network, so obviously the loss will also not change. So we will just alternate between these two types of uh, line segments, and we'll see how we can construct a path from a uh, neural network to its dropout version. Um, yeah, so we will recurse from the top layer. We will use type B moves to prepare for the next type A move. So uh, we'll, I will show you a concrete example. You don't need to look at the uh, path here. Uh, so, but. Um, What's important here is um, let's talk about the notations. So, so these are the three weight matrices. Uh, this one, uh, L3 and R3, is the top layer weight, uh, and this is the middle layer weight, and this is the uh, uh, weights for the bottom layer. Uh, I've partitioned these matrices into blocks uh, because basically I'm thinking of uh, I'm partitioning the neurons into two halves at every layer, and I'm going to drop out the right half of every layer. Uh, so, uh, so in our paper, we actually have a pass of seven steps. That's mostly there for, because we want to give a general pass that, that's good for induction. But actually, for this three-layer network, you only need uh, these five steps. Uh, so let's see what, what's going on. Um, yeah, so. So the first step is fairly simple. So I have this network. Uh, I will just change the top layer weight uh, so that I no longer have any connection to the right half of the neuron. So this is basically a equivalent to dropping out uh, half of the neuron only at the top layer, which by assumption is, is something that's good. Um, so uh, and I'm, uh, these two networks only differ in the top layer weight, so uh, I can directly interpolate between them. Uh, and now, uh, since this green part no longer have any output, uh, I can actually change uh, its input to whatever uh, uh, I want. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the input for these neurons uh, to be two times L2. Uh, so basically uh, kind of doing dropout on this layer already. Uh, but doing this doesn't change the objective function because uh, these, uh, these things are not uh, outputting anything. So this, um, it, uh, what's, if, uh, what's active is still this part of the network, but this part of the network is prepared for the next step. So in the next step, I'm just going to flip the uh, top layer weights from the left to right. Uh, and uh, I can do that because obviously the first network uh, has low loss according to our assumption. The second network is actually equivalent to this network, which is just the dropout version uh, where both layers uh, have their neurons removed. So the two endpoints are good, and they only differ in the top layer weights. So I can go from here to here by just a linear interpolation. And the final step is uh, just now that this part of the neurons no longer have any output. Uh, I'm just going to zero out their weights. So uh, uh, at the end, I have this network, which is equivalent to a dropout version of the original network. Uh, of course, this is only a proof uh, or a illustration for a three-layer neural network, but you can do the same procedure for a multi-layer neural network, uh, and, um, and the result will follow from an induction. Uh, so we did some experiments on this. So the paths that we construct are not as good as the paths that people were able to find in practice. Uh, so here, uh, these are two paths that we were able to uh, find. Uh, so the first one is for a smaller scale things on MNIST on a, using a three-layer uh, convolutional neural network. Uh, and on MNIST, uh, on the small uh, example, things are fairly good. Um, 
uh, the loss and accuracy are fairly constant uh, along the path. Uh, but in the bigger scale experiment uh, on the CIFAR-10 data set using a VGG network, um, it's actually harder to find a path, mostly because, uh, so here, as you can see in the middle, the loss is actually kind of large and the accuracy becomes slower. Uh, note that this is still much better than the direct interpolation. Direct interpolation has a loss that's uh, much larger than 0.2. Um, so the main reason for not getting this good result is for VGG11, uh, if you do drop out on all the layers, which is required by our theorems, then uh, the performance actually drops fairly significantly, uh, especially uh, if you do drop out on many of the top layers, it really doesn't change the performance, but once you start doing drop out on the first or second layer, uh, the performance becomes much worse. Uh, well, not much worse, but significantly worse. Uh, question? So here in this uh, picture, you construct the path uh, based on in, like, your theory, your construction just now or from some other method? Yeah, so this is exactly according to the theorem uh, that I just showed you. Uh, question? So if you have a um, local minimum, then how do you test whether it's a dropout stable local minimum or not? Well, uh, I guess the existential version is hard to test, but what, what we can, uh, what we do here is we actually just randomly drop out half of the neural. So that you can efficiently test. I, I do suspect if we have a better way of pruning the, pruning the neural neurons to, ha to produce a better a small neural network, then we would get better performance, but we, we didn't uh, have that. Okay, so uh, just to sum up, uh, for neural networks, we can show that not all local or global minima are connected, even in the over parameterized setting. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, solutions that satisfy some nice properties like dropout stability are actually connected. Uh, but there are still many open problems here. So first, uh, obviously the path found by this uh, property according to our theorem they are still more complicated than the paths found in practice. Uh, the paths we construct uh, it has um, many line segments, and in the proof that I showed you, the number of line segments is going to scale linearly as the number of layers. In practice, you just need two line segments, right? Uh, and also, paths are known to exist in practice, even if the solutions are not as dropout stable as we have hoped. Uh, for example, if you, uh, you can look at the experiment on CIFAR, right? Uh, uh, so if you just run the empirical algorithm, you can actually find a very nice, nice path there. Uh, but I guess what I'm mostly interesting, uh, interested about is can we leverage this mode connectivity property to design better optimization algorithms? Because uh, naively, this property seems to say something about optimization that you, you would at least not, stuck at, not be completely stuck at a local minimum because you are connected to the global minimum. Uh, but it doesn't give you any algorithmic guarantee because you might still be uh, at a very flat local minimum. So the convexity property that Leon talked about on Monday is actually a stronger property because it means that you can uh, have a small descent locally. So yeah, if, we, uh, if it's possible to prove the stronger result uh, about the connectivity, then that would definitely have some uh, algorithmic uh, implications. Uh, thanks. So I have a question. So on this plot you've shown, so accuracy was a training or test? Uh, uh, so all of these things are on training. Yeah, so uh, I wonder how it, uh, how it behaves for test accuracy. Uh, it, this midpoint, does it give good generalization or not? Uh, it, it actually gives similar generalization, so the plot on test is very similar to the plot on training. I, I, well, I, I have no explanation so for that. So basically, trajectory gives you actually minima that generalize well. Yeah, I have no explanation for that, uh, but uh, that's empirically observed. Any more questions? Yeah, so uh, can I confirm on one thing? So when you're interpolating between two solutions, like do they need to have the same dropout pattern or not? Oh, they don't need, uh, yeah, so there's one uh, step that I didn't describe. So uh, obviously if their dropout patterns are not the same, 
in the middle, you need to do some permutations to make sure they, they drop out on different, uh, on disjoint subsets of things. So then you can do the linear interpolation. So, so uh, but that's not very hard because you have many zero neurons, you, so you can use them as uh, intermediate points to swap other neurons. Another question is that you mentioned, like, uh, in practice to check connectivity, it suffices to have only two line segments. Uh, yeah, that, that's uh, what's presented in the pr previous work. I see. Okay, and th that's true also, uh, like, uh, what, what's the largest data set that this is true? Uh, yeah, I mean, in, in the paper they did it for CIFAR, I think. Have you got the questions? Uh, <coughs> yeah, maybe I missed it, but did you give the proof of the first theorem, the, the, the input? Like, oh, no, I, I, did, I didn't. Can you say proof. a word about it? Uh, yeah, I guess um, the intuitively uh, to prove that they are not connected, we actually construct two uh, log, uh, two global minima. Uh, so basically, you, you have two kinds of features. One kind of feature, um, um, so actually one kind of feature gives you the ground truth solution, uh, but it relies on cancellation, so you have both positive and negative coefficients on the second layer. Uh, the other set of features uh, are, are uh, you need many more of them, but they only have positive weights on the second layer. So then you can show to go from first type to the second type, you need to have some zeros in, in, the, in the top layer, and then that, uh, you can show that at, at that point, it is not going to have low loss. Yeah, thank you. Okay, let's thank Ron again. <laughs> Our next speaker is Yuan Zhe Li. Uh, he, he, he is from some superposition of Stanford and, at C, and CMU. Uh, I don't know with what coefficients. <laughs> Uh, yeah, coefficients is like uh, 0.3. Okay, thanks for inviting me and thanks for coming to the talk. And today I'm going to talk about the first proof for the most simple example of over parameterization. And as usual, the uh, key of this talk is simple. So it's, it's going to be extremely simple, which means that the example is really the most simple example of over parameterization. Uh, yeah. So, wait. This is not really working. Maybe let's just do it in that way. So, or maybe let, let me try. Sorry, you, you guys saw the background because this is my wife's laptop. It's not me, so she's, she's, she's using that picture, not me. Okay. Uh, yeah, so. Uh, what is over parameterization? As we all know, it's just by having much more parameters in the network. As Ron said, it's not more neurons, but more parameters in our neural nets than necessary, which means that you have more parameters than the number of training data, or you have more parameters than the minimal number of parameters to represent the target function. For example, your target function can be represented by a neural network of two neurons, but you use 2,000, but you have a million training examples, that's also kind of over parameterization. And then it improves the performance of the neural network in both training and testing. Kind of like this, you have a small data set and then the large neural network is better than the small neural network. So it's a common phenomena. And then what is the most simple example of over parameterization that you can tell your kids uh, in high school? So this is uh, the, the example which means that you have a target network that looks like this. You have a, a two-layer network with ReLU activation, and then you have ways AI star and WI star. And the input is in dimension D, and the hidden neurons are in dimension D, and all the WIs are orthonormal vectors, and all the AIs are minus one and one. So this is like a target network you want to learn, and all the coefficients are sampled randomly. So this is a super good network. Okay, and then you have n equal to poly D training examples of this that are X size are all Gaussian, so everything is super good and very simple. And the, y, the labels are just the value of the target network. And then you want to use a target network of exactly the same form, so you have D hidden neurons, and then you train it using L2 laws and you run SGD over the set of with AI and WI starting from random initialization. And actually, the training process doesn't work. 
it will stack at about local minimum. So even if there exists AI star and WI star, so there is zero, there is zero law solution, global minimum, but you cannot find them by proper parameterization, even in this super simple setting. And but using a target network of form that has much more neurons, M neurons, like M is equal to poly D, uh, actually you just need a little bit larger than D, then run with L2 laws, uh, running SGD over the set of parameters starting from random initialization, your training works and the generalization works. Okay, so this is the, the most simple example. Yes. Two G or like uh, something like ten or ish, but okay. that's not our theory. We are for no, no, I mean in practice. Yeah, yeah, in practice, you just need like ten ish. Right. So this is the most simple example. Everything is super simple, it's just like this picture. So you have this. Target network, the input is Gaussian, super simple. Then the linear is unitary, super simple, and then ReLU, and then a linear. And then you use the same structure network, like this, this is a proper learning, it doesn't work. And then you use an over-parameterized network, which is much larger than your ground truth, then it works. Okay, sure. so it's, it's what's yes? The dependence of, what's the dependence of the uh, number of neurons on the number of iterations of SGD? Uh, number of what? Iterations of SGD. Oh, it's, it's going to be polynomial. Yeah. How many examples you see? Uh, polynomial in D, so N is equal to poly D. Okay, so that's the most simple example. Is the input is Gaussian, the, the hidden weights are unitary, and the linears are plus minus one, so it's super simple. Okay, this is a folklore example. Everyone knows it for a couple of years, and it's also reported empirically, for example, in, in Ron's paper. So now the question, the real question is, can we actually prove it? So can we formally prove that the over-parameterization does help in both training and generalization in this super simple example? And, uh, and more importantly, what is the fundamental reason behind the over-parameterization that is helpful. And so let's start with the prior works on over-parameterization, and they are going to be fundamentally different from this work. That's why we start with that. So what is the prior works? The prior works uh, on over-parameterization, there are many works on the connection between over-parameterization and neural tangent kernel. Uh, for example, you can see my talk at Simon's, is, uh, according to their ranking, it's the 17th to be done. Talk. So at Berkeley, what does it say? It just says when the following OPS condition holds. That just means you didn't provide the title on time. <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh, when you have over parameterization, which, which means that the polynomial over parameterization, so there are two O in this one. And then you have proper learning rate. Uh, sorry. Uh, Maybe I switched, uh, sorry, it's, a, it's not proper learning rate, it's proper initialization, sorry, I made a mistake. So you have proper initialization and small learning rate, and then the learning a, a neural network via SGD essentially reduced to learning its neural tangent kernel, which is convex. But according to my paper with Zhe Yuan, uh, the neural tang as a corollary, the neural tangent kernel cannot learn a target function with ReLU activation in the, in our, inverse poly D accuracy when the input is Gaussian. So even when the target network only have one simple ReLU, so you, you, so, you have a simple, so you have one ReLU as the target function, the input is Gaussian. Then if you use NTK, then you need like a exponential in D in number of training data to learn it. So it's, if you have poly D training data, it's definitely not the regime of NTK, so it's different from, so our work cannot be explained by NTK. So that's a, that's a message. Okay, and then there are also prior works such as given proper parameterized neural network and a good initialization, not a random initialization, which means that your ways has spectral norm, for example, zero one differ from W star, so I have a warm star, then running SGD over W works. Note that W stars are unitary, so the, the spectral norm is one, and you really have to be much closer to W star than random initialization in order to the training to work. So 
So there is no error parameterization here. No error parameterization. It's a proper parameterization. Mm -hmm. But you need a warm star. Otherwise, if you don't have warm stars, then it will stack in pure And do you feel, so this holds for like even W being adversarial but close? Or it's like also uh, random? Yeah, adversarial but close. Sure. But W star has to be unitary or close to unitary. So according to Michael Cohen, this is a, such a dumb result, which I agree. And it's a result of myself. So I, I can agree with that. <laughs> so and, uh, uh, and there are other works, for example, given proper parameterization, and you use a different loss function, and you use a different learner network, and you switch back to value, you do all these tricks, then it works. Uh, it's called landscape design. And according to their paper, analyzing the original problem is technically challenging, and the, risk, the solution can be potentially enlightening and whatever. So it's, a, it's not an easy problem. Okay, that's the message. And also there are like uh, works that says that like, given exponential amount of over parameterizations and noisy SGD works. But if you use exponential amount of over parameterizations and you run linear regression over feature mappings, it also works. So there's no advantage of neural network compared to uh, like convex problem if you have exponentially many of neurons. So now the key th advantage is polynomial in this simple example. So here is the summary of our work. So you're given a target network of the form WF star that essentially as what we say, but with a linear term. And it's more general than the simple example because R can be anything smaller than D. So you can have some missing nodes. And the AI stars, they don't need to be plus minus one. They can have some constant condition number. And then you have a learner network of the same type, but it's over parameterized. And the over parameterization is polynomial. And the number of training data is polynomial. Then you run mini batch SGD starting from random initialization with the one over polynomial learning rate. And it's rich generalization error one over polynomial after polynomial learning iteration. Yes? So I have two questions. First of all, this like parameters of the original network, they're random or it can be anything? Uh, they are anything. But why do you say it's, uh, so why do you say it's more general? So you basically prohibit small AIs, right? Yeah, you prohibit small AIs and okay. yeah, but. So it is less general, but. Originally, the, the most simple example AIs are oh, just yeah, plus so minus. <laughs> And here, the WI stars are, can be arbitrary. AI stars can be arbitrary, but W star has to be and also small known. Small AIs are problematic in some way, or? Uh, sorry? Small AIs would be problematic. Uh, with large condition number may be problematic, maybe not. It's just a matter of the proof that we can only tolerate constant. Mm -hmm. So everything here is polynomial. There is nothing exponential. So what do you mean by poly learning rate? Yeah. Uh, sorry? Uh, what do you mean by one over poly D learning rate? Uh, one over poly D learning rate, meaning that the learning rate is the, of the SGD, the eta is inward, one over poly, one over D to the 10, something like but that. But it's a, a constant. Uh, yeah, it's a constant power in the polynomial. Okay. Yes? So if you want your generalization error to go to zero, will all these polynomials blow up? Uh, no, no, no. Then it will go exponential. It's stuck at some polynomial, like one over D to the 5 ish. It will not go down by too much. Even like the mini batch SGD. Yeah, even even if the mini batch SGD, there's some variation. You have finite number of samples, and you can go to zero overall. Uh, you can go to zero, but then you will need like exponential over parameterization to go to exact zero. But go to inverse polynomial, you only need polynomial. Sure. What's the dependence of uh, the learning rate and the number of iterations on M. Uh, there's no dependency on M. Like, well, I guess what is the power of M in terms of D? Uh, the yeah, of good question. So M can be larger. This, uh, these powers are arbitrary. So M can be any polynomial. And uh, N can be some power. Like essentially M can be larger than all these powers are quite flexible. And also the learning rates are also quite flexible. So essentially there's no dependency between the polynomials at all. All those polynomials, except for the generalization error and the number of iteration. So 
for example, M can be larger than N or can be smaller than N. And also to simplify the analysis, we note that AI and WI are positive scaling invariants. So in this work, we actually just reparameterize AI by the norm of WI. So we only need to consider training over WI instead of two parameters, WI and AI. Okay, that's the simplification. And then this is not the neural tangent kernel regime due to the size of the random initialization. Uh, especially we, uh, by random initialization, we mean WI are just uh, no Gaussian with one over M variance. And so the AI has norm one over root M, but neural tangent kernel regime require AI to have norm, uh, to have absolute value approximately one. So that's a key difference between this one and the neural tangent kernel. Yes? But you can also scale so that NTK also has uh, WI go to one over uh, yeah. Right, but if you really use over. this scale, then it's not NDK. You can always do some tricks so it's NDK, but if you stick with this random initialization, then it's not NDK. But, but your learning rate is also pretty small. Yeah, but the random initialization matters to decide whether it's NDK or not. Right, but wait, so is this a different uh, Maybe we trust? can discuss it uh, okay. after. It's a, it's, a, it's a hard question, yeah. Right. Thanks. So since it's not NTK, then what, why does overparameterization help? We actually present a new tool, which is a polynomial size coupling with a non-convex but infinite neuron process. NTK is a convex and infinite neuron process. That's the main difference. So uh, with sufficient overparameterization, actually the optimization process of the network is actually simulating an infinite neuron process, which is not convex but still have a benign landscape. That's a key. And the main difficulty is why the infinite neuron process has a better training performance since it's not convex, and why it's simulating, the, why does the finite overparameterization simulating the infinite overparameterization with only polynomial size overparameterization? So that's the main, two main difficulty. And so let's start with the first one. What is the infinite neural optimization process? So for simplicity, just for this talk, we focus on the case that R equal to D. So it's really a unitary matrix and all the AI stars are positive, like, and all the AIs are all positive. So this is a simple case. And then ignoring the linear term in the loss, then the population loss, which is the expectation of Fx minus F star of X, is given by this uh, formulation. There's some, uh, yeah, so there's some difference between the, 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 uh, each of the momentum of WI and the momentum of the ground truth. So it's a known formula where the WI bar is just a normalization of WI and sigma i are like the Hermit coefficient of ReLU which decrease inverse with i. So this is kind of the loss formulation. And that random initialization, WIs are Gaussian. And what is the infinite neuron process? The infinite neuron process is nothing but you replace the summation of WI everywhere by just the expectation of W everywhere over some distribution over R to the D. So this is a this is an infinite neuron process, and originally the, the infinite neuron, the distribution is just Gaussian, okay? So there is a scaling difference here and here because this is summation, this is expectation. Uh, yes. So, but... So you're saying that instead of M nodes, you have like distribution over... Yeah, you have a distribution over nodes. Instead of you have a, a bunch of singleton nodes, you have a distribution over all possible nodes. So the distributions will be evolving during time. Yeah, it will be evolving over time. That's the infinite neuron process. And what is the infinite neuron evolving process? The infinite neuron process is you update this probability distribution over the, over, over the gradient descent on each individual weight, individual node. But each individual node has zero contribution in the expectation. So how do you actually define that? You define it by you assuming that the individual node has one unit influence in the expectation. So you have this term and like this term. 
And so then you take gradient over V at the point of W. So it's more or less you are pretending in the expectation this neuron has one piece of contribution instead of uh, infinitesimal contribution. So then you update the, then it has a gradient. So you can update it, and this is the infinite neuron process. Okay? So it's kind of like doing SGD over the distribution P. And now it's going to, starting from here, it's a little bit technical. And there's a loss function has, has two terms. So there are zero term and the second order term, which look like this. And as Ron said, these are like matrix type of terms or PCA type of terms. They cannot identify W star uniquely. They are like rotation invariants, so you cannot use them to learn WI star. And then there are some fourth order or even higher order term like this. And these are tensor type of term. Just remember Ron's picture. They are the terms that identify W star uniquely up to permutation. So these are the terms that is good for learning WI star. Okay. So, uh, so the infinite, so what is the special about infinite neural optimization process? Why is this uh, easy to optimize? The key observation is that through the optimization process, the distribution of P is always symmetric in the sense that if you know the value of uh, Wj star times W for all the J not equal to I and all the absolute value of Wj star times W, then the sign pattern is going to have a half probability at uh, plus or minus. So it's like a symmetric distribution over the base of Wi star. Uh, yeah, so that's the key. And it's easy to observe because everything here are quadratic, are like even power of W. So it doesn't really matter what's the sign of W. And the, so the distribution is symmetric. And so with this symmetric uh, property that allows us to simplify many cross terms when calculating the gradient. For example, we have expectation of W star. Now it just become a correlation between W and WI star at every component. And then the tensor term now also become much easier. So yeah, this is just some illustrating example. You don't really need to understand that. But you just simplify a lot of calculations with this sign symmetric property. There are many cross terms that are gone. OK. So now with this sign symmetric property, uh, you can actually show that after a, a small number of iterations, the zero order and the second order term, which are the PCA type of term, will become very small. They will become smaller than the first order term. And then the optimization process then enters the tensor decomposition phase and then use the tensor decomposition to identify WI star correctly, which means that distribution will convert to some singleton distribution over WI stars eventually using the tensor decomposition phase that can actually identify WI star correctly. So the entire infinite neuron process is really a mixture of principal component analysis and tensor decomposition. And this is super non-convex. It's non-NTK, but still it has a, a good landscape. Okay, that's the key, the key kind of high-level proof structure of the infinite neuron. So yes? The they distribute it on our, uh, some RN, and this N is like number of like second layer new, like. Uh, no, this distribution is over W, it's over the hidden neural. So you have a distribution oh. over the, the RD. But what is D? Oh, just D, D is the input dimension, yes. Input so it's, you have a distribution over the set of hidden I neurons. See. So I guess like if you start tending D to infinity, is it like easy to explain what this process tends to in some way? Like uh, as much as D, so it kind of doesn't matter. We are only considering finite D. I see. Yeah. Because D equals to infinity doesn't really make sense because then you'll have an infinite, infinite uh, Fubini swarm. Well, with proper scaling, of course. Yeah, 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 okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes? 
fact that the ground truth neurons are orthogonal to each other, I guess it's used in the previous slide, right? Yeah, it's the, it's the, the symmetric property. Second yeah. degree and second degree. If yeah, it's only yeah. approximate, then it's approximate, you, then it's also approximate symmetric. You can you can maintain can still some do something. Yeah. So, like for random neurons, it should like. Uh, for still. random, I'm not sure it will exactly work, but when the rank of the neuron is much smaller than D, like square root is, and random neurons do work. So, so okay, so I mean, you really need to use the fact that the number of neurons is less than D, all in all, in the ground truth. Uh, if they are random, if they are, oh uh, yeah, so you really need to use the fact of that. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Yes. So, uh, uh, the fact that the ground truth is distributed over a Gaussian is it only used in the, this form, this formula? Where no, no. Actually, the ground truth wi stars they can be arbitrary. So the wi stars they can be arbitrary position, but they are orthogonal. No, 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 no. like the data. The data is used. Oh, the data is distributed according to Gaussian is for this formula to hold. And then you don't use it again. After yeah, you don't use it again. Okay. Yeah. So like this, so if you try to generalize it to some other distribution, uh, then you may have a change of this formula. But so, but is this formula crucial? Like, like do you feel like if you change the suppose it's not isotropic Gaussian, but it has some coherence? Uh, it's, for current proof, it's a little bit crucial because if I different coherence is like you have wi stars that are all not orthogonal, and yeah, then it will be a bit tricky. So now the real question is, how do we move from infinite neuron to finite neuron with only polynomial size over parameterization? So maybe the naive approach is just to say, my wi star is the whole site is close to the true distribution, for example, in Wasis and Dissens. And this is actually impossible because it's a d-dimension distribution. And anything close to p in Wasis, you have to have two to the d number of neurons. So it's not close at all to p in Wasis and Dissens. And then the naive approach is whether finite neuron can preserve the key observation, which is a sign symmetric. Like throughout the optimization process, the wi is approximately symmetric. Like if I pick a random neuron, I conditional on the sign patterns, on the value of all everything except one coordinate, then is this a sign approximately symmetric? And it turns out that this is also not possible because if you want to have some sign symmetric property, like for example, wi stars are just uh, uh, ei, it's a basis vector, then it just means the sign of each coordinate of wi are, are kind of symmetric, then you need at least two to the d neurons. So it's also not possible, and also it's super far away from being sign symmetric. So the, you cannot really use this one to simplify the cross terms. Explain the phrase again. Can you go back? The condition yeah. in the sense that for every R, conditional on E, value of that? Uh, so it's kind of like. I don't understand the phrase, just maybe I'm missing. Uh, it's kind of like your uh, condition on this, which is that the value of WJ star and WI, the inner product. Uh, for every j not equal to r, and also the absolute value of w r w i times w r star. So conditional on the value of this w i at every uh, at every uh, at every direction, and the absolute oh, value of that's the definition w. of e. That's yeah. the definition of e. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Yeah, I said it was a comma, or it was a different. Okay. Okay. So what is the real way of coupling the infinite neuron dynamic? This is just saying. I have W, I go through the gradient update, I go through this, 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 and so I start from W, I go to some operator on W, I go to another operator, and then there is a finite neural dynamic for each WI, I go from WI, I go from some operator on WI and go to the second operator, we have the finite neural SGD, which is so doing gradient design on this, pop, on this empirical loss, and then, this is a real coupling which just says if my original wi is equal to w, then is this uh, infinite neuron process close to the infinite neuron process eventually at the last point. 
if I can show that, then I can really couple the two process. So you are actually coupling the entire optimization process. So what is the arrow for the first step, for example? There are, so go from WI to the empirical version, empirical step, there are actually three steps. So you first go from W1, a T1 of WI to T height 1 of WI, which is an over parameterization arrow. Uh, it's kind of like you're moving from the distribution over P to a sample of, to, a, to M samples of WI from the distribution of P. So you, you have this inside of the whole distribution. And then there is a sample arrow, which means that instead of having the real loss formula, you have the uh, L height, which is the empirical version of the loss. So it's not hard to see that this one scale with one over root M because you are sampling M of the neurons uh, from the distribution. And this one scale with one over root M because you are sampling N data from the distribution. So here, one over root M is, is the true role of polysize over parameterization. And then this is like one step. And the question is for many steps, like you you do, you do many steps, then how does the arrow propagate? And the fundamental question is if the, at the previous step, the arrow is epsilon, then at the next step, whether the arrow becomes smaller, like it's a contraction, or it's, it's become slightly larger, uh, or the next step, uh, it becomes much, much larger. So for example, the contraction is typical for a convex problem. You start from something far away, but then you go to something close to each other. And the super large amplification is typical for a non convex process where you start from this valley, and, but you differ from it a little bit, then you go to the two disjoint directions. So you have a very large amplification on the coupling arrow. And the infinite neuron process is a mixture of PC and tensor decomposition, so it's highly non-convex. But uh, fortunately, uh, uh, as a critical part of the proof, what we, are, we can show is that there, there are some W where it is an exponential amplification, but for the most of the WIs, it is a mild amplification. So by mild amplification, we can see it's like one word poly D, so we can tolerate poly D in number of iterations to reduce the arrow to inverse poly D. Okay, that's the that's a poly D, where's the poly D? So together with the infinite neuron process, we can actually prove the final theorem. Okay, so here it's a, yeah. So this is a result. We actually show that the running HGD on over parameterized two layer neural network with ReLU activation, it can learn a smaller two layer network with ReLU activation when the hidden weights are also normal and data distribution is spherical Gaussian. The key message is the polynomial size over parameterization is actually simulating an infinite neuron process, which has a better landscape. It's a mixture of PC and tensor decomposition. And then the better landscape means that it's a symmetric property of the distribution and the mild amplification property of the arrow. And when the hidden weights are not also normal, then at, at least in the worst case, it requires two to the D queries for the SQ model, which means that you have to have exponential over parameterization, but also there are open problems like whether it's not worst case, but close to orthonormal, then how can you make this? How, what, what kind of the mild assumption you can get? And yeah, that's my talk. Thanks. Further questions? Yes. Is there a distinction with what you call infinite neural limit and mean field? Uh, yeah, uh, what? Like mean field limit, where you just take the number of hidden nodes to infinity and you you analyze how the distributions get updated and stuff like uh, that. Yeah, I think our approach is, is exactly off that form, but we define like this. Uh, sorry, we define this uh, update of the. Uh, we define the distribution update uh, 
how do you update the distribution via this formula? And you can define another other formula. For example, you do gradient descent on the distribution, which might be different from doing gradient descent on the neural individually. And that one may be more close to the mean field. Okay. Uh, <coughs> yes. Can I extend the results to three layer neural networks? Uh, <coughs> I'm not sure. That's a good question. The three layer neural net, the formula, formula is going to be super difficult. And yeah, it seems this kind of result heavily relies on the fact that uh, that work can be written as a weighted sum of rectified linear functions, right? Uh, yeah. So it, this is a simple example that is specially yeah. tied to two layer, and it's not practically even relevant, I should say. It's just the proof of this example that you show to the students that over parameterization works. OK, maybe one last question. OK, let's thank Yonji again. You can Right, OK, so anyways. for the final talk, we are happy to have uh, Suvrit Sra from MIT. OK, thanks. Final, final talk, I'll be fast. Uh, hopefully, I'll be fast. So thanks for st sticking it out. This talk uh, is about, uh, again, in the regime of over-parameterization to talk about actually the memorization capacity of RELU networks. This is work with m my student uh, Charlie and my colleague Ali Jadbabe. And I should say, uh, essentially, all the, as you can expect, all the actual work in this project is done by Charlie, who's sitting back there. So uh, big thanks to him. And uh, the motivation is, of course, uh, I sh don't need to repeat this, but just uh, mention this kind of experimental motivation that many of uh, us are aware of, that over-parameterized neural networks trained with SGD seem to be able to memorize pretty much uh, arbitrary stuff. And so one, one particular way to try to understand the over-parameterized phenomenon is, is to understand uh, the expressive power of a neural network. So for instance, classically expressive powers of neural network is uh, an ancient topic which goes under the name of, name, uh, of universal approximation theory that uh, neural networks can kind of learn continuous functions over compact sets, etc. But the, those results are kind of trying to answer uh, too much in the sense that, okay, you're trying to just consider function approximation. So you're just trying to learn the underlying function which could have generated your data, for instance. But they're not saying much about finite samples. We are trying to focus here on memorization, neural network being able to overfit any empirical given data regardless of really learning an underlying concept. So we're trying to understand that's why the concept of memorization. So we want to carefully understand that pretty much given any kind of training data, how, how powerful is a neural network? Uh, how powerful does it need to be? Uh, or how powerful is a given neural network? So that it's powerful enough to just memorize the training data. And so basically, it's connected to this expressive power theory, but now we are just focusing on a finite set of training data. That's really the focus. And so let me just mention one, a couple of simple definitions. So we'll just call finite sample expressivity of a neural network as the network's ability to satisfy the following condition. So you have arbitrary, essentially arbitrary training data pairs, xi's and yi's, and we'll say that uh, if your neural network is able to figure out parameters theta such that it can exactly satisfy that equivalence, then we say the network has the power to uh, do finite sample expressivity. And uh, I look at now a special case where p is the output dimension. So let's, uh, like classification and simple regression will fit uh, in there. Uh, D is the input dimension. So we'll say memorization capacity is the largest value. So the memorization capacity of a fixed architecture that you're giving me, of a, a fixed architecture neural network, to be the largest value of n. n is the size of the training data for which the network has perfect expressivity. 
So, I mean, th th this definition is simple, but I hope uh, it's clear, right? No, con uh, no contention here. Because I'm just going to casually now use the word memorization capacity or memorization to really refer essentially to this setup. Uh, for mostly, I'll talk, focus on the case where the output dimension is one, but the many, many related things, not all, can be also said when the output dimensionality is bigger than one, like for instance, multi class classification. It's vaguely related to VC dimensions, the formal. Oh, it is uh, n not only vaguely related, it is related this way. Uh, it's important to actually recall this connection. So, memorization capacity, I'm just repeating this for just think of P equal to one is the largest n such that for all data, there exists a parameter that you can fit. In VC dimension land, the maximum n for which there exists a data set that can be shattered, essentially, that you can, be, that you can really fit exactly. So really, the, one of the core differences is in the quantifiers. There's some other finer points that often the VC dimension theory is stated by adding one more quantifier over all possible architectures, but I'm kind of blotting that out. The one major difference is here. So hence, clearly memorization capacity is, going, is less than equal to VC dimension. Okay. So classically, th there has been work from uh, prehistoric times uh, also on memorization. So uh, people have studied memorization capacity of neural networks with classical activations like sigmoids, et cetera, mm -hmm. dating back to some construction from Cover, and, and, and many more. More recently, people have also studied memorization ability of ReLU fully connected networks, or of ResNets, or of uh, ConvNets. So uh, there has been related work on this topic, but there is something missing that many of uh, the recent studies on memorization capacity of networks, they kind of make very strong assumptions on the number of hidden nodes. And this thing came up actually multiple times today, like Ronge mentioned about what he calls mildly overparameterized or low overparameterization. Yuansi also mentioned that. Uh, so for instance, the strong assumption, which I call strong assumption here, is this type of result, which says a one hidden ReLU, uh, so this is a two layer network with one hidden ReLU layer with n hidden neurons can memorize any arbitrary data set with n points. So, but the, the width is as large as the training data. Similar stuff happens in other results that the width and hence, uh, I, I'll, I'm calling it width, but let's just say number of neurons, the number of nodes in your network. If that is the same size as the training data, that is extreme overparameterization. And we want to step away from extreme overparameterization and talk about memorization capacity when the overparameterization is closer to what uh, Ronge also mentioned as mild overparameterization. So, rhetoric question here for you can we use depth to memorize with fewer than n neurons? And because it's a rhetoric question by the theory of questions, the answer to this question is yes. So I'll talk about that. Uh, in the interest of time, I actually kind of blotted that stuff out. It's just a, an additional result we'll skip on the way. But I'll focus mostly on the memorization capacity of uh, fully connected neural networks. And by tight, I mean both lower and upper bounds on the number of neurons. So here is the like set. Yeah. So before your work, no one analyzed like more than depth, like one or two. So know. nobody, to my knowledge, uh, exploited depth to uh, reduce the number of, except for other types of activations. The threshold activation. The sigmoid type of stuff. So there somebody has looked at, I think, uh, two layer, and you but real, real uh, without, uh, uh, we were actually not even aware of that originally. Uh, so which activations are you analyzing? ReLU. ReLU and ReLU-like. So the, with the, we are trying to remain close to the kinds of stuff people use. Uh, so here's the setup, training data, n data items, d dimensions, uh, p, let's just say p is equal to one. So I'll actually uh, make an important assumption, but it's a mild assumption that uh, all the training data points are distinct. If not, you can add a random perturbation, but let's, uh, th uh, th this is for the sake of consistency. 
and that all the y i s I have scaled them to lie in that interval minus one to one. So here actually p is equal to one. It's just easy to describe that. And this is the standard neural network architecture. You have the activation at each layer, and that's the final network output. So, and the activation we are talking about looks like like yeah relu like activation. So it includes relu as a special case, and it has some other uh, relu like activations. Yeah. This is more in the regression style of things, right? You want to exactly So for classification, we have also same uh, related results for classification, including for multi-class classification. No, but in that case, do you expect uh, the mapping to be just matching the signs or exactly matching? Exactly matching. So memorization really, f theta of x is exactly, exactly equal to y, equal to right? Y. So you but have to be exact. Is there separation between these two cases? Not really. Yeah, you can, okay. but, but memorization really means uh, I gave you x, y pairs. The network after you push x through it has to spit out y. It's uh, nothing to do in terms of loss functions, etc. Here. Okay. So here is just an illustration of kind of known stuff for scalar regression. You have d-dimensional input. You put n hidden neurons. That was kind of the known construction. What we are now doing is use power of depth. You put one hidden layer with square root n neurons. You put another hidden layer with uh, order square root n neurons. And using this, you can again do perfect memorization. So now the number of hidden neurons is square, uh, order of square root of n rather than order of n. Interestingly, of course, the number of parameters or the number of edges in your graph is O of n, the size of the training data. But the number of hidden neurons is uh, much more civilized now, closer to reality. But the number of parameters is the same as one. Layer. The number of parameters is the same because square root n uh, yeah. multiplied by square root n. There's uh, no way to get around that. So the main first main result I d deleted some notation <coughs> is a two hidden layer ReLU network where the hidden layer dimensionality, so the first hidden layer dimensionality is d1, second hidden layer dimensionality is d2. p is the number, the output uh, dimension. You can think p is equal to 1. If it satisfies this, then it can memorize arbitrary data sets, as long as you satisfy your assumption of that these points are distinct. So one of the practical reasons for making the distinction assumption is also to ensure consistency, which uh, no, uh, you, know, you, you could have otherwise bad training data where x1 is exactly equal to x2, but y1 is not equal to y2. Tough luck learning with that, but uh, uh, it's a mild assumption. So that's uh, a result on the memorization power of ReLU networks, that with two hidden layers, you can do that. A classification result, which makes uh, we add another layer. So you add a third layer, uh, and then you can using the same type of construction, you can memorize arbitrary classification data sets with uh, p different classes. You don't need this extra layer business. If you are just doing binary classification, then the same kind of stuff goes through. So the result holds also for multi-class classification. So that's the memorization power uh, that ReLU networks have, which is pretty, I think, pretty interesting to see that, OK, square root n width is more like uh, the regime where the network is already powerful enough to memorize anything. Yeah. By memorizing classification data sets, you mean that the output, the output of the new Reno network exactly equal to the neighbor, or in fact, you take a, a so you can argmax. Uh, so that argmax business starts coming uh, once you, I guess, put. Uh, uh, some special choice on the output layers or something. But what this means is the f of theta, the output will be exactly y. So what we are saying is we can construct for you a set of weights, weight matrices and bias vectors, whatever, so that once you give in those x's, we will output the y's. Nobody will use this, of course, but this is just to show. Uh, a, a very interesting uh, counterpart now to this sufficiency result is a necessity result that if you're doing this uh, like p equal to 1 setting, that if you don't have enough hidden nodes, if you don't have enough neurons, 
then there exists data sets that your network cannot memorize. So with that, you kind of get both necessary and sufficient conditions on the size of a neural network for it to have the capacity to memorize anything. Because square root n was sufficient, but from here you can see that it's also necessary. So let's, uh, le let me mention this in words again. So if you had width n, with n neurons, memorization is uh, easy, you can do that. But if you want to make the size of the network, the number of hidden neurons to be more realistic, then the uh, only way out is to trade off depth and width. And already adding just two hidden layers with order of square root n suffices to do the job. And what we showed there in those two necessary and sufficient results is that necessary and sufficient condition on width or number of hidden neurons is now, you have essentially within a constant factor of square root n number of neurons will do the job. It's both necessary and sufficient. And if you're doing multi-class classification, that's the requirement for a two hidden layer neural network the num on the number of nodes but if you add one more layer, that requirement can be improved. So rather than multiply n with the number of classes, it's just order of constant times square root n plus constant times number of classes. So that's the classification result also. So you very clearly see uh, how adding depth uh, improves things. Here the third, here adding another layer basically uh, the, the, the construction is fairly simple. It uh, encodes a P-class classification problem into uh, suitable one-hot encoding and then solves it via regression construction. The details are not important. The really takeaway of the size is the crucial thing here. Like a toy illustration, you know, for instance, ImageNet with 10, uh, a million data points and a thousand classes is already perfectly memorizable with a pretty reasonable size network. Those lower bounds, can't you get them from uh, the VC, the relation to the VC dimension? And okay. Yeah, so you get one of them from, yeah, exactly, so uh, I, I'll comment on that also shortly. Uh, can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, so, so comparing two layers with square root of n neurons versus yeah. one layer with n neurons, so in terms of n, the number of parameters are still similar. Yeah, the number of parameters are still similar. Okay, so you're just arguing maybe in one aspect the number of neurons, maybe somebody cares, and in this case it gives you a smaller width. So really the driving question for us was, uh, it's fine that with, you know, width n, you can do the job, but uh, we want to come closer to the sizes that people are using in practice, and clearly in practice people are using deeper and deeper networks, which allows them to actually use narrower networks. So what kind of width do we require to do the job? And this kind of square root n dependence, it can be refined further if you allow me to make a deeper and deeper and deeper network. Well, I, I think people are being going wider and shallower. If it's like the opposite pattern. <laughs> but that doesn't, okay. okay. I mean, that's a separate concern, right? This is a question about uh, how do you trade off depth versus width. Sure. Okay, so let's, let me just quickly, uh, is that clock accurate? 12 till seven? Yes, it is. But I, uh, what time did I start it? I want to kind of finish on time, not overreach. You have like 13 more minutes. Okay, I think I'll, I, I'll uh, zoom a bit through the proof uh, ideas. It's a really clever construction made by Charlie. Uh, so ju let's just assume that training data is like that, and uh, this is the assumption. Uh, I'll just call the clipping region to be the complement of the set where the labels live. So everything that lives outside that. So the original idea, if you think of the way you make width n guy do the job, roughly the high level idea is you essentially let each neuron here do the work of memorizing one data point. There are multiple ways to do that. 
but uh, these are if you think these are like relus then you have to tune the weights appropriately so that it essentially triggers only for x1 and kind of doesn't trigger for the rest and here uh, same thing once you figure out how to do it for one data point you can kind of repeat inductively repeat the construction for all the data points uh, by carefully selecting the weights and the point being that here you have uh, so many neurons each neuron essentially then has enough freedom of selecting the weights to allow you to do the <coughs> memorization for each of the data points and the key challenge in actually reducing the width comes from the fact that now we need to <clears throat> now we need to have each neuron in the hidden layer be able to memorize square root n points rather than one point or rather not memorize take the burden of memorizing square root n points each so there's a bunch of encoding that has to be done i'll try to quickly illustrate at a very high level the nitty gritty is still in uh, nitty gritty so uh, let's look at a case of uh, four data points i'll just zoom in uh, i'm using hard 10h as the activation this is just like bunch of two relus so whatever i say here uh, by multiplying it by a factor of 2 the same result will hold for a relu network so it's just up to constant factor of 2 so 4 n is 4 and let's also make the following uh, additional pre processing assumption uh, important very important that here is where i'm using the points being distinct so all the x i's are distinct so i down project them to a line by hitting them with a random vector u or you can also carefully select a deterministic <coughs> vector and then i sort them according to their values and i re index them so i re index so i just re index those 1 2 3 4 so that this property is satisfied that that is part of the construction now what i do is i carefully tune weights so that this neuron thresholds whatever corresponds to x3 and x4 and <coughs> keeps only stuff for, uh, corresponding to x1 and x2 whereas this neuron it takes the job of keeping track of uh, x4 and x3 while thresholding x2 and x1 and so here you can see there is so th so this one goes uh, captures x1 x2 this one captures x3 x4 uh, x1 the, the the picture is supposed to illustrate that the value coming here is smaller for x1 than it is for x2 from that picture because this is plus 1 and it's the in the opposite order so uh, there's a very careful selection of which points are to be encoded by which neurons and <coughs> who's going to be smaller than whom and then next uh, these are the corresponding activations of after you've applied the 10h hard 10h and now the most intricate part of the proof actually comes here which i'm actually going to skip the details of that but only mention at a very high level now what happens is uh, each of the next layer neurons it takes responsibility for picking some point from the previous layer and encoding its corresponding yi so what we do is at this layer this neuron it tries to perfectly generate y1 so it it tries to take responsibility for x1 and it tries to take responsibility for x4 so the rows here in that matrix correspond to the training data and the columns correspond to the neurons the last line is the bias term which i have set to 1 and so if our only job is to perfectly fit y1 y4 we have three parameters but two unknown so we have some bunch of freedom there to play with the null space so the job of this neuron is to solve careful linear system 
and very carefully select a vector in the null space so that the ones that we want to fit exactly are fit exactly and the others we can threshold. So the construction involves in, uh, there's a clever choice in deciding which data points are encoded by which neuron here. And the next careful choice is each neuron here decides to perfectly memorize which of the data points. So you see this one did x1, x2, this one did x3, x4, but this one is memorizing x1 label and this one is memorizing x4's label. And there's a reason for that. I will comment on that very soon. So you uh, do that. You, again, here this one will take care of memorizing uh, x2, x3's labels and carefully selecting stuff in the null space so that the others get thresholded. And this, so, so far this may kind of look like uh, some choices may look arbitrary, but there's a very important reason for making this kind of alternating choice, like selecting how to order them here and then from each of this, which one to repeat here. So like here we selected y1 and y4 corresponding to x1 and x4, here we did x2, x3, is because if we uh, don't do that, then, or rather what we want to do that, what we want to do is that now, what goes out from this layer is y1 and a 1. So think of it, this neuron for data point x1 says y1, this neuron for data point x1 says threshold it at 1. So it, you get y1 comma 1, and that's the bias term. This neuron for y, uh, x2 says a 1, this one for x2 says a y2, and then you have a bias in the same way. The reason I'm doing this now is because if you look at it, if I were to now just simply select these as the weights, connecting this stuff to the output layer, what is the output corresponding to each data point? We are able to generate here y1 plus 1, y2 plus 1, y3 plus 1, y4 plus 1. So this very careful interleaving allows us to output for each xi a corresponding yi plus 1, which is what with, uh, uh, sorry, oh, some bad wrong button got hit here. Watch the animation in painful detail. So that when you add them and then remove the, subtract the minus one weighted bias, you will re repeat exactly <coughs> perfectly yi through uh, yeah, all the yi's. And this construction is, uh, I'm only showing it for four points. It's actually a bit more, slightly more elaborate because here I only push things to plus one. I didn't show you pushing things to the minus one regime, but uh, the idea is very similar to interleave odd and even in the right way and then pick the th uh, points in the second layer in the right way so that you can actually get them to output yi plus one. Anyhow, so uh, the, the fact that all of this uh, works out is in the uh, terrible details in the paper. And the job of the first layer is to, as I said, pick points in this uh, odd and even alternating manner. Second layer's job is to select the indices of which points to memorize. And then uh, by the construction, they get memorized. And the same idea can be generalized actually to deeper networks. Uh, and that extension is possible. Let me skip the details. Uh, so here is the, what we talked about. So if, uh, I should have written, uh, yeah. So this, this one is in terms of parameters. So coming back to your comment, uh, Greg, on number of parameters. So if P is equal to one, actually theta of N parameters suffice to memorize N data points, which, and this, and we showed that there's a lower bound of omega W on memorization capacity. W is just the number of weights or, or parameters in the network. And then there's a result of upper bound on VC dimension of WL log W by Peter and others, uh, which gives an almost tight upper bound on memorization capacity, assuming the depth L is a constant. So up to log factors, uh, you get essentially tight bound on memorization power. Let me skip the stuff for ResNets. 
And uh, am I out of time? time? Two more minutes. Okay, cool. So I'll just mention a quick result. Uh, so that was on the memorization capacity of ReLU networks. And there was a, another result on memorization capacity of ResNets that I kind of skipped. And something that we are just beginning to investigate, so this is a very simplified kind of result, is the behavior of SGD near memorizers. And so this is the standard setting we are using. So we are actually using here a strictly convex differentiable, et cetera, loss function. And suppose you are at a memorizing global minimum. So suppose your network is big enough that a global minimum is certainly going to memorize the data. Then uh, we analyze without replacement stochastic gradient descent with mini batch size b. So this is the SGD update we run without replacement which is again closer to the SGD that's implemented in practice. So it's doing true, true without replacement sampling. So for that, there's an informal result which uh, states the following. If you initialize your SGD pretty close to such a memorizing minimum, so, so memorizing minimum is a global minimum, right? Because uh, let's say the loss is non-negative, so there the loss will be zero actually. So if the uh, initialization of your SGD is pretty close to the memorizing global minimum, then in a small neighborhood, because of those differentiability, et cetera, properties, I'm pushing away the non-differentiability of ReLU here under the rug. Okay, bear with me on that. Uh, it, it satisfies that we are within O of rho square, this Taylor series expansion close to theta star. But the statement then, now if you run SGD from such an initialization with a small enough step size, then your risk is going to become O of rho to the 4. But it's uh, not, not, not a, a complete result because uh, it could also be that uh, what we could show is that, okay, then after we have found the point theta, we could only show that the point theta is within two times the original distance. So it's not that theta has come closer to theta star. The risk is guaranteed to be smaller, but after some point, theta could also leave the nice neighborhood within which the dynamics and guarantees of SGD hold. So it's kind of, uh, and the restriction is on how small is that neighborhood for which we can show the risk shrinks Quantifying that neighborhood is, uh, seems to be a very challenging task. But the good thing is that this result is independent on, of any width, depth, distribution, et cetera, assumption of stuff. It only depends on uh, that your network is able, uh, has a glo uh, memorizing global minimum. And once we have reached uh, the part where the risk shrinks to O of uh, that epsilon to the four, after that uh, we could not analyze what uh, SGD does. So actually understanding the behavior of SGD without too many more assumptions near a memorizing minimum is still hard. One remark I'll mention before ending, for people who analyze SGD, one of the reasons we actually use without replacement SGD here is that uh, because we train neural networks in epochs and without replacement SGD has a nicer property that you do have a descent theorem after an epoch. And descent theorems are really helpful for proving stuff about shrinking the risk. So I think given that, I will just uh, stop here and uh, mention to you the archive preprint which lists all the gory details of that stuff as well as a bunch of other work we are doing on uh, neural networks. So, uh, thanks. So maybe one quick question. Okay, uh, Les, thanks for reading okay. it. Yeah, so before we, before we all leave, let me...